Uh, tonight we're going to have a, an amazing show because L.A. and I are going to talk about the corresponding areas of our research, and obviously all of those of us who will be at Branson uh, September 15th through the 17th are pretty much original researchers going out in the field and traveling, uh, you know, to wherever we need to go and sending our film crews there. And I want to make a statement right out of the, the shoot that we are going to see now so many leaks in the dike that has held back the truth for so many literally millennia that as we come into the, I would say, the fullness of the biblical last days being uh, shown uh, in living color for us all. The idea is simply this, that the greatest cover-up and cover-over of history, they're coming apart at the seams. And so I believe that it will be God's initiative to reveal all of the hidden works of darkness, not the enemy using the hidden works of darkness to destroy God's people. And, you know, I want to deal with something right out of the, uh, the box on this, too. The reason this whole thing about giants is so important is because God guaranteed in Genesis that, uh, you know, basically the seed of man would conquer the seed of the serpent. But yet the devil has been trying all he could in all the times and machinations and all the power that was afforded him as one of the most powerful, if you will, archangels. And actually he's more of a, uh, you know, an anointing cherub, according to Ezekiel 28. But the point is, is that these things are coming to pass right before our eyes. And as we were basically, uh, L.A. and I were together with Tim Alberino, all the people that went with us on the conference, we had Anselm P. Rambla give us a blow-by-blow account of the places we were at. Uh, obviously, one of the world's lead explorers who uh, more than clued us in to the areas in Peru that are, interestingly enough, aligned up again with Orion. Uh, lined up, uh, lined up. Excuse me, with Pleiades, and so what's happening is everyone's worried about, or not worried, but saying to me in my email. I'm sure you're getting it, Doug. La, I'll turn it over to you, La, in a second. The fact that you know, what do you think of the alignment that's coming in September? What do you think of the eclipse that's coming in the 21st? And I said, well, that's that's good, and you know, there are people that are smarter than I am on that stuff. But I'll say this: it will pale in comparison to what's coming up on the Earth. Because you're going to have a synchronicity or a corresponding set of releases that are going to be in the heavens, on earth, and uh, not only earthquakes, but disruptions. And if my emails and they're increasing uh, panic, now I'm talking about Christians. I know that no Christian should panic. We're promised in the Word of God that basically, uh, you know, God will deliver us from our fear if we obviously surrender to Him. But fear is coming upon the earth because Jesus said, men's hearts failing them for fear for looking after those things coming upon the earth, and that's up on the earth. So as the volcanoes rage and as the earthquakes, you know, increase in intensity, and as the uh, lies of history, which have been promulgated to this point, continue on and on and on, it becomes really apparent that we are in a different world now than we ever would have thought we'd been, and everything is accelerating. So I'll turn it over to L.A. and L.A., when you're, you know, uh, and tired or want to break, give it back to me. But <laughs> let me ask you this. What's 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 the credit, or forgive me, not what's the credit, but what's the area of your expertise now where you, you're concentrating your efforts, having just gotten back from Peru, having obviously going to be one of the keynote speakers, True Legends Conference, Branson, Missouri, September 15th through the 17th. So tell me, where, where are you at right now? Because we haven't talked, Doug, so you know, since we both got back from Peru, I don't think we've talked. We've emailed a couple times, but go ahead, L.A. Well, Steve, first of all, happy birthday to you. And uh, Thank you. I think I'm a little older the last time I checked, <laughs> like six months or a year or something. But, you know, anyway, I just hope you had a great birthday. But, you know, well, thank you. Um, if, I, if I can, yeah, if I can weigh in here just for a second. It's amazing how <laughs> the powers that be let stuff out or somebody blows it and lets stuff out. And what I'm talking about, and I, I, I sent it over. Um, it, it's in the chat, Doug, if, if you can, you know, it's on my Skype thing. I sent it over to you guys. But it's a picture that was found on Ynet uh, a couple of days ago. And it's, it's a typical archaeological picture. There's a skeleton that they uncovered, and it seems to be a Canaanite, yada, yada, yada. Thing's got six fingers. It's got six fingers. The skeleton, plain as day, just like I found on Catalina, it's got six fingers. Now, normally what happens, just like at Catalina Island, when I discovered that cache of records, 
um, and had already been picked through. Archaeologists, anthropologists, researchers had already gone in there. They had taken all these photographs. Everything was cataloged in Manila with Gooden, Gooden photos, Catalina, Gooden photos, San Miguel. These are the Channel Islands right outside of uh, Los Angeles on the California coast. So everything was cataloged. It wasn't like I was opening up a trunk and examining everything. Well, that wasn't the case. Everything had been picked over. And what amazed me is within two hours, I was finding anomalous, and I mean that, underline that, and italicize it, photographs that shouldn't be there, elongated skulls, six fingers, the two skulls, just under Boy, hey, Doug, he's really we, cutting out we, on every we, other word. On, on Catalina Island, what we discovered were anomalous photographs. We discovered nine footers. We discovered elongated skulls. We discovered six fingers. All that's not supposed to be there. And all those photographs were hidden away, literally. Hidden away in museum boxes, never to see the light of day. When we published An Armored Trail of Nephilim 2, what has now gone viral, the Ralph Gooden photograph where he's standing in front of the giant. When we went back to the museum, it was redacted. It, in other words, cropped out of the picture. The picture was was blown up, thrown up on the wall, and underneath the picture was a hit on Ralph Gooden. Came to me in real time, everyone from halfway around the world. I'm going to be kind of cautious here because I got to tell you something funny. When we did, and, and L.A., we're being watched, you and I, we're being watched by the people. You've probably been on the History Channel and A&E and some of the programs and stuff. But let me tell you this. Uh, we're being watched, and the minute we watch them, they, you know, it's interesting because they're going to people like Tom Horn, uh, Cliff Mahooty, the gentleman, the uh, Zuni elder, and they're basically following in our footsteps, but they're going to try and put their spin on it, okay? And we all know what the spin is. It's the alien spin. Yeah. So, again, the idea, and, and I'll turn it right now to L.A., the idea is, and this is a, a warning to those of you who are original researchers, be careful of phone calls that want referrals, because what they're doing is they're going to tie and take the narrative away from us. Go ahead, L.A. Well, you know, absolutely. You know, our research down in Paracas with the, with the DNA, which, by the way, is ongoing, and right now, and I, I don't mind saying this, but we've got about 31 samples at two different labs, and, and they're being, we've done extractions, we're looking for haplogroups, and those results will be forthcoming as soon as I get them. It, it'll be, um, you know, we'll make a formal announcement and talk about it. And we might even do some peer review papers. But interestingly enough, the same character that you're talking about, Steve, also um, went out, out of his way to find a, uh, a Darwinist who was also basically a geneticist who looked at our, our DNA work that we did down in Paracas and disparaged it. Well, Mondo Gonzalez, who's our head archaeologist down there, he's, he's an American citizen, but he, he, we, we employed him, and he comes with us down to Peru. We did the extractions, and we, we, were abs we have it all on film. We haven't released that film yet. It's all on film. We did the extractions um, to the T, exactly the way we're supposed to do it, um, as instructed by the Paleo DNA Lab, which is up in Canada. And what's amazing, this woman writes a hit piece, and this, you know, this guy that was on Coast to Coast, I won't mention his name either, um, goes out of his way to disparage not only your work, but my work. But no one ever contacted me, which, of course, is the biblical mandate. If you've got something against your brother, you know, why not, why not come to me and say, hey, L.A., what about this DNA? And I can tell you and I can show you. Uh, from from different labs that the haplo groups, first of all, um, are Middle Eastern and European. That rewrites history if it holds. So far, we've got uh, six samples that that are European or Middle Eastern ancestry, which goes against the Darwinian paradigm. Now, of course, this woman is saying, "Oh, it's all contaminated. Oh, it's all contaminated." Well, that's easy to say from her point of view. It's very easy to say, "Well, it was all contaminated," but how does she know? It was contaminated. And why do we keep getting the same results over and over and over again? And so it was just a blatant hit piece. And of course, Mondo Gonzalez wrote this very, very fair rebuttal, which I posted. And it's been crickets ever since. It makes me wonder why someone like this 
would go on coast to coast and insist that there's nothing over seven feet. And yet I've got photographic proof of just under nine feet out in Catalina Island. And this is exactly what Glidden said. This is why I went out there and I tracked it down because I got wind of a story that was published in the Los Angeles Times where Glidden talked about a race of giants that he was beginning to uncover out on Catalina. And it made the front page of the LA Times circa 1919 and 1921. And by going out to Catalina, and which took, by the way, six months to get at, to gain access to the archives. But when I got out there, there were the photographs. And you know, you say not only the, the giant skeleton, but the elongated skulls are there. The six fingers are there. And you you know, you can't people go, oh, it's cradle headboarded LA. Look, the more and, and again, this this one particular guy will tell us everything's cradle headboarded, nothing to see here. With all due respect, this gentleman. I use the term somewhat loosely. Um, he has never handled one of these, to the best of my knowledge. I've handled multiple uh, skulls and not cast. I mean, the real deal. I've been, to, I've been to numerous museums. I've had access to these things. What we've discovered is the morphology, and I'll be talking about this, by the way, at Branson. This is part of what, what I'll be discussing at Branson. And that, you know, folks, it, I think it's sold out or close to it. So live streaming is the thing to get at this point. And live yeah, streaming, it, 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 yeah, let me interrupt you. It is yeah. sold out, so live streaming is the only way to get it. And again, L.A., you're going to break stuff. We're going to break stuff. And Anselm P. Rambla, who's held on to some of his discoveries for 40 years, I find it interesting because all of us are going to be there. And then people can use their God-given ability to pray, their God-given ability and knowledge of the Word of God. But when I get – and when I hear – now, look, let me say this. I'm not a nice person, okay? I'll say it so you don't have to send me this and say that, yeah, I'm not a nice person. I admit that. But at least I want to have the intellectual honesty to basically uh, deal with facts and not pull on some hellish Darwinist uh, in a Christian argument to dispute a Christian brother. First of all, let me say this. In defense of L.A., my work, Tim's work, others' work, when we go digging up, and literally the case, not just old bones, but old records from the the conquistadors that knew how to measure stuff and skulls are 42 inches from the eye socket to the back of the head when there are over 12 records or records forgive me of stuff that is uh, uh, on the uh, what would you say on the radar and on the scenario of everyone else then you can go and sit bothers me. It bothers me that people are that stupid to say, well, there's nothing over nine feet. I will make a statement right now that will probably astonish everybody. But the, the idea that there are people in the U.S. military and special operations of branches that everyone is known not to exist, in other words, there's no records, even to the point of, uh, you know, uh, finger um, fingerprints and other identifying marks being manipulated in such an extent that even if you had palm prints or anything, you couldn't tell that these were the original people. But when they tell me that they're battling the same things, L.A., that your guys told you that Al, you know, that uh, all over, uh, uh, all over the, uh, um, what would you say, all over the military, I'm sorry, I got so much to say in a short time, that there are so many uh, eyewitnesses to this that it now is coming to the point in the mouth of two or three thousand witnesses, let every word be established. So, ladies and gentlemen, you may not believe the 1880s or the uh, 1909s or whatever the reports of the Kincaid expedition, but you were told that, and we were told by an insider, 174 million artifacts that are historically out of place or scientifically out of place are stored in the warehouses under the Smithsonian's care. And just to prove this, and I'll give it right back to L.A., I'm excited about this. I've been fighting with the uh, 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 pimples waiting to pop. That's a pretty gross description of some people that don't believe anything about the giants and they make sure that their opinions are all over the internet. Finally, finally, there are some people in Australia and New Zealand that have done a marvelous tracking of Maui. Maui is one of the islands, obviously, in the Hawaiian Island chain, but they don't understand that that was also an Egyptian seafarer, that basically there's so much evidence now, it can't be denied, that sailed the entire Pacific. 
sailed the entire Pacific. The gods of Egypt were in there and everything. Now, fast forward to the late, um, oh, the late 1880s, and uh, one of the guys who was an Egyptian uh, prime minister, he asked the Smithsonian, he asked the U.S. government to return all Egyptian artifacts that were in the United States or to destroy them. Now, what does that sound like? That sounds like basically an Egyptian parliamentarian or, parliamentarian or, you know, the prime minister basically wanted everything covered up or brought back under his control. So what I'm saying is this, ladies and gentlemen, when I hear, and I, I'm saying this, when I hear someone make a dumbass statement like there's nobody over seven feet tall, well, then he better just give it up and forget basketball because the point being, is that thousands of records testify against him. Every myth and legend testifies against him. Every single newspaper article, every single find, people that have spent 50 years of their lives on the opposite side of the world tracking this. So again, somebody says, well, you sound like you're a little irritated. Oh, yeah. But it's beyond irritation. It's beyond the fact that why would someone claiming to be, quote, a believer, attack when he can't attack on the basis of fact, but just make, you know, uh, uh, stupid statements, but he can't back it up on history. If we write books, if we talk to the Native American elders, if, if L.A. goes to Peru, he deals with, with all the Paracas skulls. And by the way, that's not head binding. Why do you think the Egyptians, who didn't practice head binding, head bound? How do you think blonde-haired, blue-eyed people got to Peru uh, in the Chachapoyo region? How do you think those blonde-haired, blue-eyed people ended up in the South Pacific? How do you think all this stuff spread? It wasn't because of isolationism. It was because right. of diffusionism. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah you know, that th those two words, isolationism, diffusionism, we need to just break off for a second and talk about it. The Darwinists believe in isolationism. That's the prevailing paradigm all through archaeology, all through uh, the Darwinian scientific community. That's what they believe, that people are basically isolated. They really don't move around. They just kind of stay there, and things move very, very, very slowly. I'm a diffusionist. I know Stephen is. There's a whole bunch of us out there, and the diffusionist believes, no, people want to travel. People go, well, what the heck's over that hill? I don't know. Let's go. Okay, let's back a lunch and go. And that's what we believe happened. We know, look, I'll tell you something, Steve. It's really interesting. Um, the isolationists insist that America's Stonehenge uh, didn't exist, that the Phoenicians weren't there, yada, yada, yada. And yet, and yet, when we go to America's Stonehenge, which I've been to, and, I, and it's actually when, uh, all that research is in one of the books plus a YouTube video, whatever. The bottom line is, and it hinges the circle, there are standing stones, sometimes 100 yards, sometimes 200 yards away from the center of the hinge. So when you stand there in the center of the hedge on the summer solstice, which is the longest day of the year, the sun comes up over that standing stone. Most Native Americans did not create sites like this, but it, wait, it gets better. And this is what's amazing. And this is the work of Kelsey Stone. He went on Google Earth and he drew a line from the center of America's stone head, which is in New Hampshire, okay? Drew the line out to the summer standing stone to see where it would go. And he continued the line and continued it and further and further and further. And he wound up in England, but he wound up in Stonehenge, England. And that line bisected perfectly the center trilithon, which is three stones, two uprights and a column on the top, creating like a, a, um, a bar up on top, a, a doorway essentially. And that's impossible. And it's not a coincidence. And when he continues the line further because of the curvature of the earth, all you flat earthers out there, you wind up in Beirut, Lebanon. Beirut, Lebanon was one of the homes of the Phoenicians. It's diffusionism. They traveled. And that site was abandoned. And then you move over slightly just to another place where I've been numerous times, the Great Circle Mound in Ohio, which when you stand there, the first thing that hits you is, my gosh, how did they do this? There, it's a hinge. There's a moat on the interior, a waterway on the interior, which goes down about eight feet below the surface. The entire area is dead flat. Why? Because the moat won't work, or the, the hinge part, the waterway inside the hinge will not work unless the area is flat. That begs the question. 
how do ancient Americans in the Stone Age, because there are no iron tools pre-Columbian, how did they do that? There are no transits. How did they do that? There are no levels. How did they do that? Yet it's there. And originally, there were two serpent heads at the entrance to this thing. It's a highly charged place. They found evidence of human sacrifice. Surprise, surprise. And what's amazing is originally, when the white man came into the area, they asked the Native Americans, who built this? And the Native Americans, and this is on record, stated, we don't know. It was here when we got here. And that goes back to, I call it Nephilim architecture, fallen angel technology. Because in my opinion, that all these sites, you can only really appreciate them from the air. And who is the prince of the power of the air? Asatan. So good question. Oh, hey, hey, Doug, I can't resist. Maybe that's what the Beatles were talking about, strawberry fields forever. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry, I'll let you just Oh, you know. man. Well, it, 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 you know, coming out of my mouth, that question seemed a little bit odd. However, I had to ask that question because that's been bugging me for like two years. I just, because it, it, it almost seems like everywhere I go or everywhere I look with respect to these mounds, there, there are strawberries. And maybe it's just the, the area. I don't know, but help me out. Interesting. Interesting. Very interesting. All right. Okay. Well, hey, Doug, are we taking a break or are we going through it? No, go go through it. Uh, you, your words are okay. valuable. Network has agreed to, to bypass a break. So go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank all of the sponsors, too. Here's, here's where we're at, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the Rosetta Stone, which was found by Champollion that gave the ability to translate hieroglyphics into Greek and Dodatic, uh, you know, which is kind of a, I think it's a Syrian language, D-O-D-E-T-I-C. There are so many stones now you know what's interesting about the witness um, excuse me <coughs> and we got smoke in the air in montana and it's just pollen central we've got so many witnesses in the stars and in the monuments of stone and for the record fake news didn't exist then the idea was simply that they recorded what they saw they tried to explain it but the advanced technology of all of the positioning of the megaliths, the monoliths, the cyclopean architecture, the Nephilim architecture, the mathematical genius of it all, it did not come out of a pond, and it did not come out of uh, people crossing the land bridge into uh, from Eurasia into the uh, you know the North American, South American continent. What it is is it's a testimony to the fact that they they this is the I think this is the point we got to get across L.A. the official if you will a subversion of truth they're going to use all of these everything we've been talking about Tom Horn's been writing about we've all been talking about writing about making videos about it's all going to be used by the globalists, the luminists, the Satanists, the Luciferians to present a total different history than the Bible. And what's critical to understanding this, the one thing the devil hates more than anything is the Word of God, the Holy Bible. It is now Google's, uh, they're going to have a committee to determine what is no longer going to be allowed to be placed on the Internet. And I don't know if you saw that, L.A., but let me just share this. If it's perverse, twisted, uh, sick, disgusting, it's okay. If it's righteous, redemptive, moral, and has anything to do with the Bible, it will not be allowed. And uh, I think Susan Duclo is writing an article, maybe she's already written it, but the point is we're there now in time where we're trying to teach people, and one of the things that Branson, I want to make this clear, Branson's going to present, by the grace of God, a start-to-finish understanding of all this stuff. Uh, and it's really, excuse me again, boy, a tough night. It's really imperative that people see it. Now, they can't attend. It is sold out, totally sold out, but they can live stream. I I would encourage those of you to understand that not only we're we just presenting all this cool old stuff, but, uh, you know, Henry Gruber is going to be there, and he's a statesman in the kingdom of God. David Langford's going to be preaching on Sunday, and it, it, we don't have, listen, most of us don't have what it takes to, to go through what we're going to be going through in the coming period of time. I don't know if it's years, I don't know if it's months, I don't know if it's five years, I don't know that. The point is, though, is I know this. That by the way this thing came together in record time, by the way, I'm talking about the Branson, Missouri, by the way everything lined up, L.A. was able to go to uh, 
uh, Peru, we were able to get some met, meet some amazing people, you know, down there. But the way it all lined up and stacked up right now, and then September is the conference. I see God doing a thing. He's shortening the time, and His people. And those of you that can attend, you. You won't lack anything outside of you know uh, you know a bunch of people being there because obviously a lot of people like to be conferences. I'm not short selling it, but I'm just saying this: we've gone to a lot of expense to make sure everybody's got a front row seat in the live streaming. Uh, the guys that are setting all this up are professionals, so you can go you know again to the conference page, Gen, Gen Six. What is it? Gen Six Conferences dot com. Uh, let me make sure of that. I've got so many websites, Doug. I can't even keep them straight anymore. No, you got that. You got that one right. Yeah, Gen Six Conferences yeah, dot com. But but the point, yeah, but the point is, is that they need to absolutely um, get signed up for live streaming. We have to buy buy it in blocks of a thousand. And so if we go over that, and there's not, uh, you know, we're we're going to be stuck at certain numbers. So it's Gen Six Conferences dot com, and you can go on the the middle banner, True Legend Streaming. Now people said, now get this, we were telling people on your show, we broke the story about the conference, and they said, well, I didn't think that, you know, I could, I would have to hurry, and I said, well. I can't tell you the timing, but I know this. If God's speeding up the time, then you probably should speed up your response to the events that you're already noticing in time. So the idea simply is this, that we're going to uh, present, I believe, the most cutting-edge and up-to-date research. And, uh, you know, we're, we're not just talking about all this old stuff. We're talking about there's nothing new under the sun. If you don't think genetic engineering is going to affect you, think again. If you don't think robotic sex bots are going to affect you or your children's future, think again. That doesn't mean you're going to utilize uh, their uh, uh, machine intelligence or other parts of the robot, but the point is, is that people don't get it, Doug. Everything that God made is being attacked, and it's being, if you will, perverted. The Old Testament word is corrupt, and we have corrupted our ways. So I'm hoping people understand this. So when we're talking, look, we get pot shots taken us at all the time, and I get emails, and I'm sure you did too, L.A. What do you think about what so-and-so's saying? Well, he can speak Hebrew. Big deal. Uh, so could, uh, uh, you know, what, Belshazzar, and, uh, Belshazzar on the wall, and uh, he couldn't uh, read until it was interpreted by Daniel that his kingdom is about to be lost. I believe God has written the equivalent by the hand of God in the skies. Go look at my website today, and a picture a person submitted is uh, literally, it looks like war coming in the clouds, a guy with an M16 rifle. It looks like, and a tank in the background. Somebody says, oh, you're just seeing what you want to see. I said, it's interesting. At least it's coming from the west to the east. And that hit, that matches Henry Groover's vision. So getting back on track, the whole attempt to, to divorce humanity from the biblical truth, the whole uh, attempt to control the narrative is to basically bring in not the Hegelian dialectic, but I would call it this, the Luciferian ultimate plan. You know, it is designed to bring us to that point where everything we used to know was true is now questioned. So they, they, keeping a person in a perpetual state of flux, that's what the, their side wants. I believe what God's going to give to all those who are attending and, and uh, you know, who will see the DVDs, who've ordered the DVDs, is a sense of understanding that we are now in the time of the end that Daniel spoke of, that knowledge would run to and fro, but it's being unsealed. And it's interesting, as the knowledge becomes unsealed in the book of Daniel, in the book of Revelation, it's Jesus who is worthy to break open the seals. Go ahead, L.A. Yeah, and that's that's something that we need to understand, that we're living in a period of time. You know, I used to say like 15 years ago, I had hope. Um, I believed that, oh, things could turn around, and I know things are a little tenuous, a little tumultuous. You know, you look around the globe, and, I mean, it's you can't fix it anymore. I mean, maybe 20 years ago you could kind of fix it, but it's gotten to the point where you just can't fix it. It's just crazy. And, and I mean, there was a there was a story today on, on a lot of the media. Um, a bunch of crazy thugs went in and, and just beat the daylights out of this guy on a train um, because he asked the kids to stop smoking pot. Lawlessness. I've never seen such lawlessness, and it's rampant. It's everywhere. It's all throughout 
America. It's all throughout Europe. Look at the drug cartels in Mexico. I mean, are you kidding me? I blogged about that this morning. I mean, there's a, there's a spiritual dynamic to everything that we're seeing, and it's not going away. And you're right, Steve, when you talk about the powers that be, they are hurting this planet and the, the, not, you know, the, the leaders that we see, fine. What's behind them? That dark Luciferian agenda, which has been in play, the mystery of iniquity has been in play literally for, for millennia and continues to work and is working overtime now. And it hinges, the springboard to it is the Darwinian paradigm. The idea that, you know, there is no ultimate God, there is no right or wrong or, or moral absolutes. Do what you feel, which, by the way, is do what you want to do. It's the first tenet of the Satanic Bible, thank you very much. So everything is out the window when when we go back and we look at the Darwinists. And the Darwinist is this, Darwinism is the springboard to the ancient alien show, which says that, you know, we were visited by ancient astronauts and they seated us here. They genetically manipulated early man. They started the world's civilizations. They started the world's first religions. And now at this critical juncture, and make no mistake about it, I'm not a prophet. The late David Flynn talked about this. There's going to be a nuclear device, unfortunately, that will be detonated somewhere on this planet. And when that happens, that will create the greatest amount of fear that human, humanity has ever collectively experienced. <clears throat> and when that happens, that's when they show up and all bets are off. And that's, you know, it'll become this global, the Bible tells us it'll be a global one world religion and a one world global government. Can't buy, sell, or trade without the mark. And that's where everything is headed. It's like on steroids, the way it's heading right now. And I, I don't see any let up to anything. I mean, you got the nutcase in Korea, Kim Jong-un, doing his stuff. You got a crazy imam in California, you know, who's saying death to the Jews. We got to annihilate the Jews. My state, California, right? Isn't that great? So then he apologizes. Do we really think that that, that apology is, is worth the, the air it took to actually voice the words? Of course not. Uh, that guy is allowed to lie to the infidel. Guess what? We're the infidel. So he's lying. His, his core value, what he believes, is that all Israel should be wiped off the map. Death to the Jews. And that's why he finally said it. And it happens every Friday, Friday at the, um, in, in Iraq, or Iran, rather. They stand up and go, death to America, death to Israel. And under the Obama administration, you know, basically Obama kowtowed them. Trump is doing something different. Can you fix it? No, because the deep state is in charge. And the deep state and the shadow government has been in charge since World War II. Eisenhower warned us about it. it it's there in the JFK thing. And I talked about this, I think, last night on some show I was on. But it's true. JFK, in my opinion, the last president that we really had, other than Trump. And Trump was never supposed to be there. It was Hillary all the way. She's a globalist. And that's that's why all this nonsense is going on with Trump. They want to either impeach him, uh, have Congress do nothing. So during the midterms, he'll lose Congress. I mean, it's all orchestrated. They are going against him. The problem is, is that there are people, millions of us, who are looking at this Congress rating, approval rating is down like 10%, one of the lowest all times. Gee, I wonder why, because they're all a bunch of weasels. That's why we need term limits, but I digress. The deep state controls everything. Think about this. Before World War II, the CIA was OSS. There was no Langley. There was no billions of dollars spent on CIA operations every year. Didn't exist. Didn't exist. Homeland Security didn't exist. NSA did not exist. The Pentagon wasn't built, wasn't there. All this happens after World War II. That is the deep state. Why? Because no matter who we vote in the office, the deep state remains. These, they are bastions of power, and nothing changes just because someone new sits in the White House. That's why nothing is getting done. There's a deep, dark agenda. The fact that Paul Bagley was basically threatened three times by a guy from one of the alphabet agencies and told exactly what was happening, told the people that were on the watch list, Steve, you and I are on the watch list, as well as the Hagmans, by the way. Why? Because we're talking truth. Why? Because we always, always go back, always default back to the biblical prophetic narrative. Why? Because we love Jesus. And that doesn't wash with the globalist agenda. That doesn't wash, and that's why the pushback. One more thing, and I'll end with, with, with a little bit of a rant, but when I was, when Obama was president, we were being audited for 2013, 14, and 15. 
14 and 15, we knew it was done by the book. We switched accountants after 13 because we felt, uh-oh, because that's when we got audited. And we said, well, the, the accountant screwed up. That's another story. So we owe. I get that. But with 13, 14, and 15, they're saying we owed $150,000, which, of course, we didn't know. And then this, this lady from the IRS calls up and she goes, you know, Mr. Marzulli, I'm, I'm leaving on leave here in two weeks, and we, we really like to have this cleared up before I leave, as if I'm just going to hand them $150,000. Where's that going to come from? And, and I just said, well, yeah, I can appreciate that, but, you know, uh, I've got a lawyer working on it. My, my new accountant is working on it. He's got power of attorney. We have to go through the process. What was interesting is right after Obama left office and Trump was inaugurated, it all went away, except for 2013, which we knew we, we, we owed. It all went away. 14 and 15 went away. Was I targeted? I can't prove that. I can't prove that. I don't have the means to prove it. I, I, you know, I'm not rich enough to hire a team of attorneys to go in and find out, oh, target Marzulli. Why? Because almost weekly, I would write an anti-Obama, I call him Obama, worst president ever, blog. And they were silencing conservative voices. There's no doubt about it. I remember Bill O'Reilly when he was still on. And by the way, you don't think that's a coup? Of course it's a coup. They got rid of O'Reilly because O'Reilly was the strongest conservative voice we had on television, basically one of the one of the few, other than Sean Hannity and a few others. And I remember there was a Democratic strategist on with O'Reilly, and and he pinned her to the mat in about two seconds. He said, "Name me one, name me one conservative anchor on any major news network." And she, you could see the wheels turning as she's dead silent, and he lets dead air go by, which of course you never do on radio or TV for about ten seconds, and and she has no answer. And then, you know, he replies and says, there you go. You can't name one. You can't name one conservative anchor on any of the major networks because they don't exist. It's a managed agenda. And this is why this is why you can't fix it anymore, because the Luciferians have got control of the of the wheel. However, the good news is when the king returns on the white horse, that's the game changer. That's our blessed hope. That's what we're all looking for. Okay. Well, here's the deal. <clears throat> the agenda is simply this. The war is now on Christians. The Christians in America kept their mouths shut when all of our brethren were being slaughtered. There, there were there were few, and one of the guys I do uh, you know, admire and uh, thank God for was Franklin Graham. He was saying to the body, those who profess to be Christians, claimants, you guys, do you see what's going on over here? So we get a man that comes into the White House, President Donald Trump. He's got men of, of God praying for him. And, you know, I hear stuff, Doug, behind the scenes that I can't talk about. But I'll tell you one thing. The president knows, and I, I don't think he get in trouble for saying this, the president knows that the only one keeping him alive is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that as long as he walks in obedience to God, he's safe. Now, you won't hear that from the pundits. You know, I, I honestly think sometimes that if there were an OK Corral, there'd be more of uh, uh, claimants, uh, you know, uh, uh, out in the field or out behind the corral or whatever than and there would be bad guys because everybody's willing to, to settle on everything. And here's the thing. People will argue over everything, but they won't deal with the obvious. And I hear I made this statement. I stand by it. If you won't start fighting for the heads of your brethren, literally those who uh, have stood valiantly as their heads were cut off with the last words on their lips being Jesus as a camera zoomed in on those gruesome, barbarous, uh, uh, you know, uh, maggots from hell. The thing is, is that your head's going to be on the line. That's not a threat, but the indifference, the casual uh, Bravo Sierra whale vomit, uh, stomach <laughs> tripe of the answers that people give. And I mean, I talk about that stuff. And hey, LA, I was down in Jackson Hole, and I told the story on the radio, and I'll tell it again. 
I had a smug Christian tell me that, you know, well, we're all called to be martyrs. Well, he's drinking his fancy wine, and by the way, I kick myself for not, in, you know, christening his head with the thing. And I'm, I don't, I'm not a violent person, okay? I don't, I don't do that. But he made me so furious. The, the attitude, and by the way, we're no longer friends over that. And anybody who is smug about people being beheaded, children being uh, raped to death, children being chopped up and eaten, uh, mothers being forced to eat their own children. And have you noticed now, Doug, the drug cartels are turning to cannibalism? Uh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Yep, beheading so first, cannibalism, deal. yeah, and, and, and the uh, yep. and, and I said that 25 years ago on talk radio. It's not that I was right. It's that God gave a warning two, two and a half decades ago. And if you don't care that somebody else is being eaten who, because of their belief in Jesus, you know, and, and I even put up all the scriptures one day on cannibalism. I have never in my life been more furious, and obviously I'm working out my own salvation with fear and trembling with a lot of help of intercessors. Thank you all for praying for me, but I have never been more incensed, more heartbroken, more furious, more pounding my desk, more saying, God, where are the people that will stand up? You know, I want to put someone into, uh, you know, remembrance on your show. Years ago, remember when uh, uh, we raised money, meaning the Hagman listeners, and for Jeremiah and uh, Jamie and Amanda, they all went over, you know, to Iraq, you know, I'm sorry, if Afghanistan. And the thing is, is that they made a difference. Three nurses, I think they're all named Katie, to, you know, two Marines, God bless you guys, and, uh, you know, a, a, a wonderful woman, the wife of one of the Marines, and they had, they, they said enough is enough. Five people were responsible for stopping with the prayer backup we did at Whitestone. You were there, Doug, you remember. But the thing yeah. is, for stopping the slaughter of 45,000 men and women, well, there were Christians. No, but how many of those have converted in the meantime? And, you know, we're to resist evil, the book of Hebrews as the shedding of blood. That doesn't mean we go out and shed others' blood, but it does mean this. It means you stand against wickedness, you fight with all your might, you call on the power of God to give you the victory. As I've said on your show before, there is no victory apart from God that I can find in the Old Testament or the New, where if God didn't step in, they wouldn't have had the victory. America thinks they're going to go out and kick ass in Russia. They have no clue. And all these lying devils, and I went on Alex Jones about, I don't know, three weeks ago, and I addressed the president on InfoWars, I said, Mr. President, call back all the fire generals, because those were the guys that stood against the evil you're now having to deal with. And I can tell you this, I stand by my statement. And who am I? Someone that has been sounding the alarm for 25 years, those closest to you do you? And I would say this, that if you have a national security advisor or anybody on your team that is an absolute uh, convert to Islam or an apologist, you better look close at your own team, sir, because those closest to you are planning to do you. Now, the grace of God and the intercession of God's people, I believe, are making all the difference in eternity. And that's what it's talking about. So, L.A., when you're talking about what you're talking about, when we're trying to bring the biblical truth that the historic twisting and perversion of of history you see the reason they hate the giants let me make it clear they can't control the people they don't want the people to know the presence of that kind of evil they want to take the battlefield down to a intellectual or they want to uh, uh, state that everything that's in the old testament is a metaphor that the devil doesn't exist it's just a metaphor for evil well where the hell do you think the word evil came from where in the heck do you think the whole idea came from? Why is there evil then? And to some people, some people don't care. Evil to you and I is not evil to them. And so this is why I say, rise up, people of God, believers of God. Rise up, intercessors of God. Thank God for the women of God, the prayer warriors, the, the, the women are crying and, and saying, when will the men rise up? And
and you know the problem is in one of the books I think in Minor Prophets it states that all the men in the midst of the are women well you hit them with female hormones for three decades I don't think their offspring are going to come out as you know WWF fighters so the thing is is that we're, we're in a battle but we're in a battle for literally the seed of mankind and by identifying the whole genetic interruption by fallen angels hey one third of them fell somebody says well how much do you how many angels do you think fell I said enough to cause the entire destruction of the human race except eight people and no one his family who were perfect in their generations doesn't mean they were morally perfect but here's the deal we're at a point now that people have got to have an understanding of I would say the law first mentioned when it appears in the Old Testament you can follow it all the way through to the old let's go the Old Testament you can follow it all the way through to the New Testament or the New Testament you can look backwards into the Old Testament but God does not oppose himself uh, L.A., at this point, when you're at Branson, and don't give away anything, when I say this, I want, where is the Lord leading you now as far as integrating everything you've investigated, everything you've studied, everything you've written? Kind of where is your direction leading you? I think you just got back from overseas, did you not? Yeah, I was I was in Portugal. Uh, my wife and I traveled to Portugal, and uh, we filmed there for two weeks, and we... Um, uh, it's a new film. It's called Fatima, uh, Miracle of the Sun or a Harbinger of Deception. And uh, I just put up the actual trailer today. We did the teaser a couple of weeks ago, but the trailer is up today. It's on my YouTube channel, L.A. Marzulli. Go check it out. Um, and the reason why I'm doing this, and already the backlash is just incredible. Um, people are saying it's a hit piece against, you know, Mary, the Bible, and Catholics, and, and no one's seen the film. So we actually did a caveat in the beginning of the film um, you know, basically saying that millions of people go to Fatima every year. Millions of Muslims circle the Kaaba stone in Mecca every year. Millions of Hindus celebrate Guru Puja. Millions of Buddhists uh, go to thousands of temples all over Asia. People can believe whatever they want to believe, and we're not here to disparage anyone's belief system. But we are going to look at this one event called the Miracle of the Sun. 70,000 people in 1917. It's a 100 year anniversary. That's why I made the film. And in 1917, upwards of 70,000 people were gathered in a field in Fatima, Portugal. They experienced something. Something happened. It wasn't the sun. The sun did not leave its orbit. The sun did not come crashing to Earth. That's not what happened. There was something else. And it's been, without spilling all the beans of the film, what we've discovered is. As with a lot of this, the powers that be manage the agenda, they obfuscate the facts, they keep the facts from the people. Over and over and over again, we hear the same verbiage. Dull silver disc came from out of the clouds. Dull silver disc. And you remember in 1917, there is no verbiage. There's nothing in the lexicon that says UFO flying saucer. And I spoke with neuroscientists, research, uh, people, professors, doctors, uh, philosophers, historians, all across the board. We spent, I mean, two exhausting weeks. It was not a vacation in any sense of the word. And what this does is it, is it, it just tag teams. It just, it just links up to everything else that I've been doing for the last, you know, for decades. It's all connected. It all points back to what I call the coming great deception. And, and, and Steve, Steve knows exactly what we're talking about. Something is coming, which the, Jesus warns about it, that there'll be, uh, even the elect would be deceived. Men faint from fear for what is coming upon the earth. What, what the heck is that? And it's upon the earth. It's coming from somewhere else, in my opinion. Signs in the heavens, signs in the earth. And that's what we're seeing. And so Fatima, to me, was a harbinger of deception. Why? Because the 70,000 people in that field, many of them, their paradigm was changed completely in, in a, in a four, 10 to 14 minute experience. And I, I find that astonishing. So that's why we made the film, or making the film. It'll be out in September. Well, the nature of deception is increasing daily. And Doug, did you see the article about Google going to use, in essence, a, a bunch of uh, 
uh, people that already have a bias against God to determine what they will allow, even on their search engines, etc. And once yeah. you're on the list, you know, you get, the, what is it, three strikes and you're out. Are you aware of that story? Well, again, I think it is becoming more and more obvious that when God sets the sheep and the goats, he's the one that determines. But the policies that are being put into place, if if you're seeing already the hatred, especially in Canada, Canada now and its prime minister are incredibly becoming more. And by the way, I'm not bashing Canadians because I have tons of listeners that there's no bashing in the statement. But the problem, you know, people say they don't care what he is as long as he's cute. Well, I mean, man, Doug, that makes my head feel like a pumpkin you know, under a D10 cat, I go, you don't care what he says unless he's cute? What, if the Antichrist shows up at Knickers and pulls the uh, chain on the guillotine blade, it's good because he was cute in those Knickers? We have the most devoid of reality population base ever. People won't even do the basic homework to look at MK Ultra and some of the mind control experiments. And yet now we've got neural implants, we've got John McInsane coming out of his brain issue and voting against Trump. We've got all the fake Republicans that basically, you know, I, I, I can't even, I don't have a word yet for the contempt I have for those guys. You've got, you, how, how do you even begin, okay, if you're the boat and you're the captain and you think everybody's rowing with you, but they're down in the hull of the ship drilling holes in the, uh, you know, hull of the keel, you're going to sink. You can, you can give the best orders. You can even point your sails in the wind, but they're trying to sink him. So we must pray as, as Christians. Let me say this. You know, I'm sorry, but the people that are out, uh, you know, and look, does that mean we morally give Trump a pass? Absolutely not. But I believe in something. I believe the simple statement that Jesus catches his fish before he cleans them. God doesn't gut sinners. He basically brings them to the conviction where they want to change, and then the spirit of the living God is free to move in their lives to bring about the necessary change. And, and you know, the thing is, is I'll tell you this. You know who's going to be, and you, LA, you know this too. And please, we've talked about this. The people who are going to fight the truth the hardest are the ones who are going to embrace the falsehood the fastest. And I'm talking about claimants to Christianity. Go ahead, LA. Well, you know, again, Steve and, and, and Doug and Joe, it's just uh, um, we talk about this stuff, and I know a lot of people will, um, you know, they'll, they'll call it fear mongering. They'll say, you know, guys are always so negative but it's like it's all reality and if we were we, we were going to this one particular fellowship locally and i won't mention any names i really like the pastor he's a great guy never a word about anything political never a word about anything prophetic never a word about anything about israel nothing we were there for a year and i turned to my wife and i said i can't sit here anymore i mean i, I like i like the pastor he's a really nice guy but it's completely irrelevant. It's completely irrelevant. And and the problem is there's there's so many of the churches that literally had this lukewarm um, idea of, of Christianity. They want to play everything safe. Everything has to be safe. We don't we don't we want a soft landing place for our people. We don't want to scare the sheep. Nonsense. You want to warn the sheep. And and hats off to you, Doug and Joe, for your show because you're warning the sheep constantly. And the, the people, like I know, Steve, we both get lots and lots and lots of emails. I get emails every single day, all week long, from people who have either come across the line for the first time and given their lives to Jesus because they realize he's the truth, the way, and the life, or they've come back to him because they left the church because they, they were, and this is true, they were watching ancient aliens and they became an ancient alien devotee. They took on that paradigm, that worldview, they embraced that, and they walked with it. And then they got a hold of my stuff, or your stuff, Steve, and and, pe and other people, Tom Horn stuff, and it, it changed them. And by the way, our, those three names are used over and over and over again. Dear LA, I watch your stuff, Tom Horn, Steve Quell, and we hear that over and over and over again. And, and what it does is, is it, it brings people back to not this lukewarm deal with Jesus, but they're on fire. And they look around and they realize, oh my gosh, prophecy's happening right under our noses. Why aren't more churches talking about it? 
And some churches are waking up, and that's fantastic. But it's just like the reason why Branson is sold out and there's 3,000 people there and live streaming is probably going to go through the roof, let's hope so, is because people are hungry. They're not hearing about it at their church. So when you assemble the kind of folks that, that Steve's got on the roster, people are going to walk away from that conference armed, armed to the teeth, and they're going to know the truth and the truth will make them free. Amen. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, too, the anti-pope, let's call him that, calls Jesus in the Bible a lie. You know, he Jesus, he, Pope called him a Jesus a sinner, you know? And what's in, incredible is, is that Jesus said, the thief comes and has nothing in me. If Jesus wasn't sinless, he wouldn't have been God's ideal sacrifice. So the point is, is that he took upon himself the sin of the world, but he had no internal sin. So, you know... After doing this, and when I say writing, talking, 25 years, uh, you know, and thank you all who have sent me birthday greetings. Thank you so much, and and uh, you know, belated birthday uh, greetings and stuff. The point is, is that I'm on one crusade. You know, I mean, let's call it this: the last crusade. I don't believe it's my time to go, so I want to make that clear. But what I do believe is this: at this point in my life, you know, I'm saying, Lord. Bring people to my path, and this is the same thing, L.A., I know you're claiming, and we're all claiming this, that have ears to hear. We're not telling you to take anything we say because we say it. Look, we are telling you to look at everything in the light of Scripture. And if some guy wants to come on, by the way, I challenge that person to an on-air debate. I know that debating is, is foolish, but I want to hear what he says about 1594, 1574 manuscripts from the Chroniclers of the Conquistadors. I want to know what he says about Og, King of Bashan. He said, well, the guy was a small guy who lived in a big bed. Yet Eusebius, the church father, the one that, uh, you know, some of these guys sealed their faith with uh, their martyrdom, said that, you know, he made King Og basically the, thing, the, the identical person that the Romans worshipped as Saturn and says that he's in stasis in the British Isles. And you can't understand the whole history of giants unless you go to the British Isles. L.A. was talking about the identical, or forgive me, the, the geospatial coordinates and the archaeoastronomical coordinates of how all this stuff lines up. I want to make it really clear to everybody, prior to the flood of Noah, there was a massive pyramid uh, uh, culture throughout the world. It was in the days of Peleg that God divided the continents. So there was a supercontinent. Some people call it Gondwana land. That's a hard one to try and spell. The others call it Pangea. It's, it, that's easier. But the point is, is God does something. He separates, even at that time, before, and I don't know why God chose to separate the continents at that time, but I will tell you this, if at the end of God's patience, before he judged it, the fallen angels knew it was coming, by the way. You can't read the book of Enoch or the book of Giants, not to know that. And for a free version, go on my website, Genesis6Giants.com, and click Click on the nav bar where it says ancient text. It's there for you to look at. So the point is, is that they knew. You know, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of the Lord is at hand. Let me make something clear. The day of the Lord comes at the end of the tribulation. We're going to go through, and I'm saying this, I, I speak for myself, but we're going to go through plenty of hell. And it's amazing. Do you think those guys that were beheaded for the testimony of Jesus or all the Syrian Christians who, who died, were slaughtered, bombed, blown up, disappeared? Bowled, you know, and people say, I don't want to listen to your show. You just talk about gory stuff. Well, I got news for you. It obviously isn't registering because you still live in the world of Pollyanna on, uh, there we go. I got a new one for everybody. Da -da -da -da. Pollyanna's on Prozac. They can't deal with reality, but they sure want their bloody Prozac to take those, oh, oh, in, 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 incremental bits of reality. Oh, no. Oh, no. Reality's heading in. Give me another Prozac dipped binky, okay? So, you know, I can't sell them, but I'm sure somebody could uh, start selling Prozac dipped binkies. They'd come into breaking the law, but hey, you know, it seems like that's where we're at. So I'm sorry, I don't mean to be cynical, and I am, but here's the thing. It seems like no matter what L.A. does, no matter what Tim at the Alberino does, and by the way, he's got real enemies that really don't like him, 
You don't yeah. go where he's gone in Rome and think you just, you know, get away free. God has intervened. Two days before they attempted to kill him and his family, his wife was awakened in the middle of the night. And the Lord said, Jasmine, get down and pray. And the point is, is that I can tell you this, that God warns his people before it comes. But I've asked the Lord, I don't know if you have, L.A., I said, Lord, what comes next? What revelations do you want? And And I guarantee you that we as Christians have surrendered the narrative that there is one way to heaven, that's through Jesus Christ. Well, that's divisive. Absolutely. Solomon was ready to obviously use the child sacrifice to test the true love of the real mother. The real mother was willing to give up the baby rather than see it slaughtered. The non-real mother would rather see the baby slaughtered. Half of a live child in her mind was to make her point right. Solomon was wise enough to see through it. I ask myself this, Doug, and seriously, I'm asking everyone to think about this. If you look at the days of Babylon before they were conquered, the literal finger of God wrote on the wall when the king was having a great feast and all of his debauched madness, you know, uh, your, your kingdom is divided, and it's going to be taken from you this very night. And so I think what's critical is this. What I believe, I, and I say this to the Lord, okay, I say, Lord, Will you please write it out, spell it out, and make it so clear? And you know what? After I pray that, I say, what else could he do? You know, what else could he do? Voices from heaven, the people of God, the ones that saw his mighty works, they said, Moses, go talk to God. We don't want to hear from him directly. You know, Henry Gruber tells a story of people praying uh, that, oh, send down the glory, Lord, send down the glory, religious sounding. And God said, tell them to stop singing that. If I send down my glory now, half of them will die. Think that maybe put the fear of the Lord in a few people that sing songs, not even thinking what they sing? So here's the thing. We are on a quest to make known the hidden mysteries of, of, of uh, history, the, the manifold cover-up, and in the mouth of 10,000 witnesses, if you want to deny it, if you want to think that, gee, the tallest guy in the world was something, and ALA, wait until they find out about the little people that are people are seeing all over the world, from That's the right. islands of Hawaii, the Menahuni, to all over uh, uh, the Naripan in Thailand, and all of uh, every single, the, the British we people, Iceland we people, Russian folklore we people, uh, New Zealand, Australian we people, they're not all called we people. People. They got names I can't pronounce because they're in, uh, you know, uh, Maori language or Maori language. But the point being, you cannot get away from it. The supernatural now is being thrust into, quote, the world of the denialists. And the denialists will either come to grips with it, come to Jesus, uh, you know, overcome it by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, loving not their life unto death, or they're going to some come to it. And my concern is this. Jesus himself said, if he's told us earthly things and we believe him not, how can he tell us heavenly things? And my, my answer, Lord, is, Lord, it seems like nobody believes you on anything you say. Now, there are people that do, and a lot of them listen, but I would say the majority of Christendom, and based on, you saw that, Joe, and Doug, the, the what was it, the Gallup poll, or it was one of the polls, uh, maybe George Barna poll, but, you know, I mean, 50, 60 percent of the Christians don't even believe there's a literal devil. That's just a metaphor for evil. Well, then how did evil originate? One paramecium got a bad attitude towards an amoeba and decided to maybe zap them with some more primordial goo? I mean, come on, you know? It's ridiculous. Well, you know, it's, it's, it, where, where do we go after that, Steve? I mean, you just wrap the thing up, put a little bow on it, and off we go. Um, I'll just say this, that, that the sin code is rampant. The sin code is in every single, uh, not only every single individual, but the animal kingdom as well. This whole place is under the sway of the sin code. And when we become born again and spirit-filled, that changes everything. That begins to change us. It begins to move us away from the sin code. Are we perfect? Of course not. But we no longer do the things that we used to do. Um, and, and, and some of those things, maybe they take two days to get healed from. Others, two years. Others, 20 years. It depends. And I'm not saying, you know, you got you to gotta be under something for 20 years. But 
you know, in some cases, it, it takes a long time to change a person. Look, Moses went out in the desert and tended sheep for 40 years before he came into his ministry. Paul, 14 years, uh, where, you know, before he goes up to, after he goes up to Jerusalem, 14 years. If you go through the whole, the biblical narrative, everyone spends time, what I call, come to call it, everyone spends time on the anvil in, in God's forge. And what happens on that anvil, he heats you up in that forge and puts you on that anvil and takes the hammer and begins to pound us into a different shape. And that takes time. But that is the process. I no longer am the man that I was 37 years ago when I came across the line and accepted Jesus into my heart. So what we're seeing is this, this pulling. We live in this tension. And, and part of that tension is there are people around us who, because they will not embrace the sun, and, and there's a reason for this, because of their free will, and they don't want to give up what they think is the reins to their life. They don't want to give up their sin nature or have their sin nature changed. So there's this tension all around the believer, and that tension is we are pounded on a daily basis with soft porn. It's ever no. But most people don't understand something. And since L.A., you were at Fatima and the visit of Fatima, that was Mohammed's daughter's name, too. Yes. And years yes. ago, I said that, uh, and I did, to Doug, this is a matter of record, those people who listen to me on KHNC, I said the day will come when Islam will uh, merge with Catholicism, not traditional Catholicism, but an offshoot. How is it that every time the Pope kisses the uh, Quran, but he mocks the Bible, puts down Jesus, absolutely, you know, is a, um, a man who seems to have more affinity, wanting a one-world government, a one-world religion, of course, he'd be the head of it, or he'd share his reins with it. I think it's going to be easier than most people imagine for for the merging of Catholicism and Islam to take place. Now, again, I'm not talking about traditional Catholicism. I'm talking about, I don't know, even if, if somebody's a Catholic wants to send me a, uh, an email to tell me what it is that you guys are calling it. Because, look, I have friends, some of my best friends in the world are Catholics. So I want to make it clear, okay? I'm not bashing anybody's faith. I don't agree with some of the tenets of their faith. But I know there are people that are Catholics that really love God. That's between them in God. But I will tell you this, when someone comes on the scene, fulfills all of the qualifications of the false prophet, when that guy, and I'm sorry, that you know, when that guy in the white suit starts to knock Jesus, my fur goes up, okay? When that guy in the white robe starts saying the Bible is basically not to be taken personally, when he says that the most dangerous people are those claiming a personal relationship with Jesus, you understand Understand what he's saying? Individuality doesn't count anymore. You must be assimilated by the vomitous Borg from hell. Now, obviously, I'm adding the vomitous Borg from hell. The other statements are truly his. You can go on any search engine and type in. So, because Christians have been wishy washy, because we've been spineless, I'm talking, uh, you know, I mean, everybody's got a, and, and me too, look, I've got a major internet presence, and, uh, you know, I thank God for that, but, you know, the deal is, it's when we're calling people to prayer that God moves on our behalf, this stuff gets done. You know, obviously, my rants haven't changed a thing uh, at this point, you know, but what it does change is me recognizing that I can't do this stuff. The, it, the anger of man doesn't work the righteousness of God. I know that. But there's also a holy indignation. And Doug, when Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me, I can see now what he meant by that. Why? Why, oh God? Why? Why, oh God? And, and, and somebody says, well, yours is not to question why. No. My why is the cry of my heart. But it's not why God, are you allowing us, why God do your people stand for it. I want I want that there's a good statement. That's, because that's everybody right. blames all bad stuff on God, okay? So but it's why God and, and when he says because my people stand for it, there's more scripture uh basically uh, undergirding that statement than most people would believe. God Jesus said that that if a salt loses savor, it's good for nothing, but 
trodden under the foot of men. It, it basically, in the uh, New Testament time, that's what they did to salt that was no longer salty. They used it as road mix. You know what road mix produces? Road kill. And I'm just saying this, that there's too many people that, uh, you know, can sing that uh, in the sweet by and by, but they better get it on the here, here, and now, or they better kiss the sweet by and by goodbye with other parts of their anatomy. <laughs> here we go again, another showstopper. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, exactly. You're exactly right. L.A., go ahead and pump in. Let's see how your audio is. Yeah, I hope I hope the audio is working. I, yes. I, I don't know why it's cutting out like that. But, uh, you know, I was just talking about the sin code and how uh, being spirit-filled and born again changes a man or a woman and begins to, to mold us and shape us by being in God's forge, uh, heated up in that fire, pounded on that anvil into a different shape the shape that he wants us to be. But the tension that we find ourselves in is very, j just like Lot. It, it, it's, you know, it, it, the days of Noah, you know, it just, it's just like Lot. Now, Lot's way after Noah. Okay, I get that. But in that same passage, he refers to Lot. Lot was a vexed guy. I mean, he's in a place where um, he's living with some real crazy stuff going on. Cannibalism, pedophilia, all sorts of crazy stuff. Ritualistic sex magic. And that's exactly what's happening today. So the tension that Christians feel, they ought to feel, is that we are literally strangers in a strange world. Typical, We're walking through this Typical thing, Thursday in America. This, I'm sorry. It's just, yeah. it's, it's what's happening today. You're right. Am I am I cutting out or am I good? No, you're good. I, I just wanted to I, I oh, just okay. I was just uh you know agreeing with you. It's a typical Thursday in America, which you just described. It's happening today, you know, from Marina Abramovic to you know exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And and the tension that the believer finds him or herself in is the fact that we're inundated, we're surrounded by filth, by by depravity. We're you know, we're surrounded by stuff. That 50 years ago, if mentioning it would have just people would have been aghast. Now, let's and I just pick on one one little deal. You know, transgenderism is like the latest thing. It's like you know you, we all should be proud of like Chelsea Manning and and, and Bruce Jenner. I mean, th this is what's held up the last six months of Obama's uh, ad ad administration. What does he focus on? Transgender bathrooms. I mean, are you kidding me? Are you flipping kidding me? This is what he focuses on? I mean, it's beyond the pale. It's absolutely beyond the pale. Then, of course, we've got a Congress, which is absolutely nothing. And it's been like, what, eight months? Nothing. Zippo. And now they're going to have yet another break. Meanwhile, and I'll just, I'll just bag on the taxes thing for just a second. Americans pay some of the highest taxes in the world. So everything, I look around, I look at the pornography, I look at the, 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 um, the, the pedophilia rings which apparently are rampant, which apparently, you know, you look at Jimmy Seville over in England. I mean, that that's a really weird deal. And I, I want to chime in on something here. When we were in Fatima, when we were in Portugal, true story, okay, I was hit with spiritual warfare that was incredibly visceral. And what I mean by that is gut-wrenching. I mean, physical. It was visceral. It was physical. And I, we landed in Lisbon. And it was great. We did a couple of interviews in Lisbon. We drove around. Fantastic time. Had some great interviews there. Then we drove into Fatima. And I was okay. When I, when I got to the sanctuary, um, again, that sanctuary can hold one million people at a time. To give you an idea of the enormity of the place, what it's become. And it's, uh, it's, it's I don't want to use the word spooky, but it's spooky. Anyway, so I'm there. And that night, is when it started, the spiritual warfare started. And it went on for about two to three days. What was interesting, when I would do an interview with someone, I was fine. The moment the interview stopped, bam, I would be hit again. And I'm sitting there, you know, with all the spiritual warfare stuff I know, and I'm not getting relief. And after like three days of this, it's two in the morning. And what I mean by this is I'm getting hit with every type of perverted thought you can possibly think of. And it's not, I'm not generating it, okay? It's, I'm not, it's not coming from me. These are the fiery darts that we're told about in Ephesians. And I've got my shield up. 
and I got my sword out, and I'm taking every thought accountable, okay? I get all that. Problem is, I'm under attack. And, and I go, Lord, I can't do this any longer. I got to get out of here. And I feel the Holy Spirit tell me, trust the process. So I did. The next day, it lifted. And I'm there with a historian who's also a philosopher. And by this time, I'm starting to put two and two together. And I asked the guy, my first question to him, what was here in the pre-Christian era? You know what he told me? It was a matriarchal society where they embraced the sacred feminine, where they worshiped feminine gods. And the priests, the male priests who served at these temples were castrated. That's the first thing. The second thing, there were ritual prostitution going on at these temples. There are hundreds of apparition sites from these entities all over Portugal. In other words, the area is completely steeped in the occult. The area is steeped in, the, in a principality which has reigned over that territory for millennia. It's never been deposed. It just changes shape. Metaskitsmatasai is the Greek word that Russ Dizdar taught me. Metaskitsmatasai. It changes shape because there are no female angels. And when you look at the temple, there's a temple of Diana, which comes in later in the Roman era, much, much later after the initial um, worship that's going on of these ancient gods, well, well in advance before the Christian era. The Romans come in, and they're building these temples to Diana. The same Diana that we read about, Diana of Ephesus, right, in, in, in Paul's epistles, same thing. And when you look at this, what you'll see, uh, Diana has breasts in many of the pictures, but underneath those breasts, you'll see that there are, you know, sometimes um, two more sets or three more sets or four more sets. But Gary Stearman told me that in, the, in some of the earlier statues, when you actually look at them, that below the breasts, there were three sets of testicles. So what we've got here is a chimeric, transgendered, hermaphroditic entity. And there's a new, the new a, expression I've coined. It's an interdimensional transgender. Why? Because the fallen ones are totally obsessed with having sex, but not just normal sex. They want it with the animals. Book of Enoch talks about this. They sin against the animal kingdom. This is, this is what's going on. It happened in antiquity. What do you think's going on today? It's the same nonsense. People are abducted, and they're not just, it's not just, you know, normal sex. Oh, no. I mean, it's all sorts of nonsense that happens on, on these ships. Um, Graham Hancock wrote a book called Supernatural. He's down in Brazil, South America, Peru. He's taking ayahuasca. Wouldn't recommend it to anyone. Why? It's pharmacia. It's a springboard into the lower astral. And he gets up there. He does like this like 40 times. Does it? And he gets up there and he looks around and he goes, to his amazement, to his astonishment, there are these graves. The gray aliens that then now are enculturated. You go back 25 years ago, if I say gray, no one knows what I'm talking about. Today, everybody does. Everyone's been enculturated, okay? That's, that's conditioning. So he's doing this, and at the end of the book, it's like, I don't know, four or 500 pages. At the end of the book, this is what he comes up with. Whatever or whoever these entities are, talking about the grays, they are obsessed with mating with us and creating a hybrid of sorts. That screams the Genesis 6 narrative. It screams Genesis 6. It's right there. It goes back to Genesis 3.15, that the seed of a serpent will be at war, at enmity with the seed of the woman. That sets up the rest of the biblical prophetic narrative. So, I mean, Graham Hancock is down there. He's not a Christian, but he knows. He sees what's going on, and nothing has changed. It's just gotten worse. And we are seeing every type of perversion that you can possibly imagine come to the forefront where you go back 50 years ago, I, I was bagging on the transgender thing. No one knew what transgenderism was. There wasn't even a word for that yet. Now it's part of a lexicon and it's mainstream. Need I say more? Well, I think I think I want to just pick up a little bit on this because Lilith, the night hag, that's what she's been known on. Obviously, yeah. she appears in the epic of Gilgamesh. And by the way, Gilgamesh was a real half man, half god. We'd call him, uh, you know, a Rephaim. Uh, the ancient demon of the Sumerians, and actually she was a demoness. But if you're noticing, L.A., and, and that's kind of what you're telling everyone, it's apparent. 
these things are almost, um, how do I say this, they're androgynous in the sense that they possess both uh, sexual um, uh, plumbing, okay? Let's just use that. That way I don't get in trouble. And yet the thing is, is that the the legends, okay, it's kind of like that was the devil's attempt at producing Eve. Now, let me share something. As we're talking, not only is cannibalism coming on the scene, but also bestiality has broken loose in yep. Western Europe, especially Switzerland and Germany, that I weep, and I do weep for those poor animals. And look, I'm not an animal lover. I love animals, but I love human babies, and I love human babies more, and yet if people won't, if people don't care about them, yet some people care about their animals, I'm saying this. I'm saying that the poor animals are crying out to God, for it says all creation is in travail. I'm also the one that said animals' natures are going to change. That's based on the book of Revelation. We've got things now going on in the animal kingdom that have never gone on before. Never before have have uh, uh, orcas attacked uh, boats with the ferocity they're doing now. They're attacking people. The the Pacific Ocean is a dead ocean. People, I remember I said that, and some of the stupid uh, uh, what are they called? bulletin boards or whatever they are. So it's not a third of the ocean. The Pacific Ocean isn't the third. Well, listen, you take up into the Arctic Sea, and it definitely is. I mean, I even went and dug and calculated it. Okay, and so. The point is, is that, uh, you know, no matter what you say that's true, somebody's going to do it. But I want everybody to realize something, too, that one of the pictures that I can't, uh, the Bernie relief of Babylon has her with six toes. Have you seen that? And six fingers? No. Here, I'll send it to you right now, Doug, okay. if you want to put it up on your screen. I don't know if you can get it up that quick. But everybody, you can go to uh, Ancient Origins, ancient-origins.net. And uh, uh, and take a look at this. And I'm sorry, it's it's too long for me to read out the whole URL. But I'll send it to you right now, Doug, and you can just see it, and then you can post it. But look at what you see here, and what you're seeing now. Remember, this is the country, the United States, that welcomed. Okay, we welcomed the Egyptian god Anubis. You know. And I don't say God with a capital G. I say we 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 welcome the the demon. We welcome the evil spirit Anubis. We've welcomed the ball, or you know, the um, arch of ball. We've welcomed all sorts of perversion and stuff. But this whole thing, transgenderism, is nothing more than the ancient demons, demonesses that have been chained and locked up. I'm not talking about the ones that Peter talks about that are uh, reserved for ever, reserved in everlasting chains of darkness. But what is so uh, disturbing, and I think this is the most important point, L.A., that you could make tonight. Not that everything else isn't, but, I mean, if you look to the uh, Lilith, guess who's on her right and left side? The same owl portrayal as the uh, Bohemian Grove. Okay. Yeah. Now, Doug, let me know if you get this, because if you, is, is there any way to put it up on the screen really quick, or I don't know how you guys and, work here. So. Uh, not at the moment. However, we will put this up okay. uh, retroactively, or you know, after this is after okay. This is yeah, done. but look at it, okay. And if some of you are offended, uh, you know, by uh, six thousand year old bas relief, I had a Baptist minister come down on me because I put an Atlas statue on one of my. Uh, you couldn't see anything. As a matter of fact, I had my guy, my web master, you know, block out his stuff. But the point is, is that if, if somebody wants to see something, what we're trying to talk about is we're trying to show people the sisterly wicked, uh, uh, if you will, uh, resurgence or reemergence of all of these things that were destroyed by God, and now they're coming back, okay? They're coming back. It's the same thing like, uh, if you will, the um, Amazons and Edgar Rice Burroughs. There really was an island called Lesbos. Guess what word came from that? So here's the thing. I, I see the scripture in Isaiah. For seven women will take hold of a man in that day. Obviously, there's guys on TV that are already living that. To say, take away our reproach. Have you ever thought, L.A., Joe and Doug, what that reproach is? Because there, there are seven women. They, they want husbands. What is going to destroy the family? Obviously, everything we're talking about. And, and I don't mean to be crude here. Here, but the whole basis of robots, of sex bots, uh, yeah. you know, of uh, 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 
uh, you know, all of the variations of that is basically to keep uh, the human race from becoming, uh, you know, from being able to reproduce. Now, obviously, those with high birth rates are going to tune into uh, sex bots, but, you know, it's a, it's a lie that the West has bought. For instance, the bordellos, and I'm sorry to have to go here, but I need to. The bordellos in Europe now are having even the prostitutes complaining that men are preferring the robots over them. In that day, seven women will take hold of one man and say, take away our approach. Now, it's not talking about prostitutes, uh, you know, uh, not doing their uh, uh, resident requirement of tricks to get their necessary money. But what it is talking about is we are at the time, and I said this, and, and lo and behold, it was on TV the other night. I said this years ago. I said, listen, watch how it goes. Women will start dressing more and more seductively, and pretty soon, you know, they'll, they'll be to the point where clothes will be optional, but they'll try and get around the law by body painting, you know? And so now they're doing it in Times Square. Well, what is this? You know, they are casting aside all of their inhibitions, but the point is is that the angels, and here's the, I guess my bottom line for tonight, sex is what, and I want to define sex, I know what it means in Latin, I know what it means in Old French, but what I'm saying, it's Satan's execution of the human race, S-E-X, I don't know if you heard me say that, L-A, but I was praying and that's what God dropped into my spirit. So look at this. It's powerful enough to lure angels out of heaven, the watchers. Okay, it's powerful enough to lure aliens. I guess aliens are, it's really lonely out there on Alpha Centauri. I can't take it. Let's go to Earth. You know, I'm sorry, but, but that's what they would have you believe. And isn't it interesting? Well, the aliens want to come and have, you know, sex on Earth to obviously interrupt the plan of God and the marriage. Marriage covenant is the oldest covenant in the world, you know, and I got news for you. You're not going to say, do you take this robot to be your lawful wedded uh, sex bot? You know, you're not going to, that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is a complete annihilation of the human race where the Lord God of heaven sent his son and Jesus said, except the days be short and there be no flesh left alive. And and I'm on, I, I can't even go into the headlines of the day. Go on Drudge and read the left-hand column of what's going on in the city now for, uh, you know, women, uh, because evidently there are not enough men to relieve themselves. And I'll, let, I'll just say that this is, ladies and gentlemen, on the front of Drudge. Drudge is basically, obviously, reporting all the stories, but the, have you noticed they're getting kinkier, they're getting weirder, and they're becoming more repulsive? Well, why would you even wreck my beautiful mind with this? Because I'm praying, God, what can I do, what can I say to wake people up who, if they don't wake up, they're going to perish in their apathy, indifference, and denial? You know, A I D. Apathy, indifference, and denial. And so this is where we're at. And I, 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 I sent you that picture, Doug. I'll put this up on my website, and I better put a you know, warning uh, sign. I feel like the lost in, in space robot sometimes because you know you can't even show woodcuts or you get accused. Nope, I won't put the article up, but I'll, I'll tell people here's the article. Because, again, this isn't to be sensuous. It's to give you the sense to know that the 91st Psalm, was talking about this, the terror that comes by night. And I can't even go into the way Lilith, uh, I won't go into the way she killed the men, but she used her sexuality to do it. That's all I can say. That's the terror that comes by night. She was called the desert hag. She was called the night hag. And is it interesting that even uh, the Game of Thrones has a witch that lives by drinking men's blood and turns in? I don't watch that. I watch, I watch a couple episodes, and I figured out, you know what? There is something so wrong with some of this stuff. I understand it's a great, great series, you know. They got some great battle scenes. But when you have witches that take on, in essence, the historic... Uh, and I believe Lilith was the one that uh, whoever wrote it with George Martin or whatever, that's what he's probably patterning it after. Because if you don't know this, there is an amazing amount of uh, psycho 
sexuality that leads right back to the fallen angels. So that's why God ordained holy matrimony, because all there is now is, hey, listen, guys want to marry sheep. They want to, they do horrible things to sheep. You've got women wanting to do this. With, I mean, we are totally, listen, we are totally in the days of Noah, and the days yeah. of Noah, as extreme as they were, will not even compare to the things that we are going to deal with in the very near future, and are already seeing it outplaying before our eyes. Get that right. L.A., you, we, we've got about uh, 10 minutes left of this show, uh, guys, just a reminder. So, uh, uh, L.A., any uh, any comment after that? Well, I, I, I concur. I mean, these are the days of Noah that, that we're living in. They're yeah. like the days of Noah that, that we're living in. And it's just, you know, I, I, I wish I could stay here. I mean, I wrote a book a couple of years ago called Days of Chaos. And, you know, when, when a book came out, oh, Marzulli, you know, you're such a naysayer. Oh, it's always... You know, where am I going wrong? I mean, I remember on, on some show and I challenged the host. I said, OK, just pick any topic that you want that I cover in the book. Tell me where I'm going wrong. You know, are, are we seeing more earthquakes? Absolutely. Are earthquakes growing greater in intensity? Absolutely. What about the volcanic activity? What about the ring of fire? Is that is that abating? Is it getting better? No, it's not. Look, look at the six o'clock news. I mean, look at Venezuela for crying out loud. You know, the whole country is imploding. Uh, all because of socialism. Look at the drug cartels in Mexico, where there are, they had their worst month in June record. More people are killed in Mexico because of the drug cartels than in Iraq, Afghanistan, and every place else, and in Syria, all combined. That's what's going on over there. That's what's going on on our southern border. And the reason for this is they throw the poison in. How many people that are listening now have not had someone in rehab? Have not had someone in rehab? These are the days of chaos. We are in the days of chaos. When you have a nutcase in North Korea that's playing around with intercontinental ballistic missiles and threatening to nuke somebody, that's chaotic. I mean, I, I can't, I can't, <laughs> what's more chaotic than that for crying out loud? When you've got $21 trillion in debt in our country and somehow that's okay and no one deals with it and now they're going to raise the debt ceiling again those rascally Republicans, I mean, are, it's just, it's beyond the pale. Days of chaos. The racial tension in the country, absolutely chaotic. Absolutely chaotic. California was in an eight, eight year drought. We broke it. It was an interesting eight years of Obama, California major drought. Trump gets elected, go figure. We have record rains, record snowfalls, records, you know. You tell me, is that a coinkadink? Some people say, oh, well, you're spiritualizing everything. Really? But I just find the uh, the timing of that absolutely incredible. So look, it is endless war wherever you turn. And one of my one of my favorite verses in the Bible is they will beat their weapons into plowshares, and men will not learn war anymore. You think about it. You you, you look at what's you know look at ISIS, Daesh over in Syria and the Middle East. Look at Al Qaeda. Look at the um, the radical. Islamic terrorist. And even if it's like 1%, it's it's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of these guys running around with the ideology, uh, which is their core value, their worldview, that in order to bring Islam in, we got to kill everybody, kill as many as the infidels possible. You know, throwing acid in people's faces that you don't even know, you know, just to maim them. I mean, this is the world we're living in. It's, 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 <laughs> It's crazy. On one hand, it's amazing. Think of the internet. Think of what we're able to do because of the internet. How I, we can Skype right now from different parts of the country and communicate. I mean, think about that. That's astounding. You go back 20 years ago, it's impossible. So on one hand, we've got all this technology, which is really cool. On the other, the sin nature of a sin code is on steroids on overtime, and things are just getting worse. Days of chaos, anyone? You bet. Not only that, but the... Well, Doug, one of the things I think that I'd like to make clear again, just in the closing minutes, is that I don't think, and I, I and this is just me, okay, uh, I don't think there will be another True Legends conference, the nature or the likes of this one, simply because, uh, and that's not bait, you know, come out with one. Uh, I have put off, and I want to make this clear, I know L.A. does a lot of them, and I know a lot of people do a lot of them, God bless them, that's not the issue. But this is the second one I've done in my life, and um, I agreed to do 
one, and the Lord said, you can't do that. And I said, why? He said, because I want you to obey me, and I don't want you walking in anyone else's anointing or shadow. Now, that may sound self-serving until you understand something. My calling is to make known Jesus. My calling is not to argue with the people that I argue with on on uh, emails, and I've got to just get away from that. And by the way, I'm just about 30 days away, and I'll announce it, you know, uh, for my clients and those who want to contact me on what I do. This is how I make pay my bills, selling precious metals or the books. I'll always be available for my clients, but I will be having a private email. God knows, and Lord, forgive me for being so stupid. I should have done it a lot sooner. But the point is, is that we're involved in so much right now, but I'm encouraging those of you to come to Branson and to hear what I believe will be the most life-changing, most uh, uh, not when I say this most educating thing, but also uh, Pastor Langford's been praying and fasting. I know Henry walks in an open heaven that there will be a law of impartation there. Let me tell you what that simply means. Before God took Moses, he told him to bring Joshua and Caleb before him and to lay his hands on him, them, excuse me, Moses to lay his hands on them, and to take the spirit which God had placed upon Moses and place it upon Joshua and Caleb in the Bible. Wonderful, wonderful story. But more than that now, when Jesus came and Jesus ascended, and he said, I've got to go, but I'm going to send you the comforter. And that when he comes, he's going to not speak of himself, he's going to speak of me. And this this is why, you know, people need to be considering this conference, because outside of your show, and I said this once, and some guy said, well, this guy prays for people on the air, too. I wasn't saying we're the only ones. I'm just saying that we have taken it upon ourselves to pray, just as you guys pray for us, that, you know, that you will, excuse me, be blessed. So the True Legends live streaming is the only thing that's available right now. We can't invent any type of uh, extra seating. You can go to Gen 6 conferences.com and then I will tell you if you want to know if you want to hit the floor running you need and the, if somebody says you're just pitching your own wares yes I am because you've got to get a background on what we're talking about the holocaust of giants I mean we're going to share stuff related to the holocaust of giants I think people are, their minds are going to be blown will everybody believe it no but my answer LA since I first started on talk radio take it to the Lord in prayer so you can go on true legends of series dot you can order it. You can download it. Excuse me, not download it. You can stream it on Vimeo. Uh, you can buy the Blu-ray. You can do whatever you want. But I would encourage you, those of you who are going to go to Branson, if you do not have that DVD, please get it. So we will be referring to it, and you'll see how God is laying this whole thing out in such a, here's a good word, sequential. I'm learning to be sequential. The point is, is that we're going to present some information that is going to be mind-boggling. And some P. Rambla, and, and L.A. was there. He knows it. He basically, obviously, had an encounter with God in some way. We're all praying for him. Please pray for him. One of the most amazing men. Wouldn't you say that's true, L.A., that you've ever met? Yeah. Yeah, he's a really great guy. Really great guy. And, and I'm talking brilliant. I'm talking about genuine and, and the things he suffered because of the truth he turned up is unimaginable. So I, I'm telling you guys, those of you that can't come to Branson, please, please live stream it. Because he said, and I, I think I've said this on your show, Doug, he's going to share things he's never shared in 40 years. And I, I know what he's talking about because LA and I saw his presentation as most of the people that went to the conference did. And I mean, it's pretty mind-boggling stuff. So, you know, the people can come. There are already people saying, you going to have another one? Well, probably there can be a True Legends conference, and it doesn't have to have me. See, it's not – I, I want to make this clear. It's about – a shoehorn. If I had to name a ministry, I'd call it shoehorn because it's helping people walk in the steps of the Lord Jesus Christ in that which he's ordained for you. Thank God there aren't two L.A. Marzulis. Thank God there aren't two Steve Quails. But you can be who God wants you to be. So we're trying to help you get into your feet uh, prepared with the preparation of the gospel. But there's way more to the good news. Jesus said, Lo, I come in the volume of the books. They are written of me to do thy will. 
You know, what books do you think those were? There's so much, and, and John said all the books that are in the world couldn't contain all the things that Jesus did. Well, in the Gospels, we got, you know, we got different uh, uh, perspectives on the different miracles, but we don't have all the miracles. So, ladies and gentlemen, please come, and again, we want to make this clear. This is going to be a conference of impartation. This isn't just to sit around and, you know, sing Kumbaya. I guarantee you that song will never be played where I'm at. And that Pastor Langford and his wife and others will be providing the music. And I think if you've never heard Kim Langford sing and the anointing that follows, I'm telling you guys, you're going to see something that most people have never seen in their entire life. And that's a supernatural move of God. So, Doug, God bless you. God bless Joe. L.A., thank you. And please, you know, uh, understand we're alive and we, we can only function by the prayers and intercession of God's people. So I, for one, again, thank all of you from the time you ever first heard of me uh, who have ever prayed for me. And I pray that my my prayers coming back at you will be multiplied a thousandfold for your benefit. Well, thank you, Steve. And uh, we, we've we've got about uh, a minute left before the end of the program. La, I'll give you. La will give you the last minute, sir. Well, I really appreciate it, Steve. That was just really well said, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing people in Branson and some of the other conferences that will be at this year. But you know, Branson's got. 3,000 people. It's sold out. It, it's it's going to be amazing. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's just, it's an honor uh, to be there. It's an honor to be on this show, uh, to talk about the Lord, to talk about end times. Uh, it's just, if you had told me 37 years ago when I gave my life to Jesus that I would be doing this, I it's just mind boggling, absolutely mind boggling. But that's the king that we serve. I think he's going to return soon. That's my blessed hope. I long to see the writer on the white horse.